Welcome to My Beauty Stack. My name is Sharma Dean Reed and I'm the founder of the Beauty Stack app and host of this podcast. I'm passionate about beauty and business and every week I'll be speaking to a founder or CEO on the role that beauty has played in their careers. We discuss their beginnings, their learnings and find out who are the professionals that keep them feeling powerful every day. Join me on this journey of reassessing how beauty plays an important role, not only in our professional lives, but in wider society. And finally, I hope you discover your next favourite beauty spot, as recommended by our incredible guests. So I basically travel around the UK with a pop-up nail salon and a squad of trans nail techs, and we offer the public free manicures for the chance to have a chat with a trans person in a bit to break misconceptions and make allies. Um, so you're holding someone's hand while you're doing someone's nails. And if you're trying to make allies and you're trying to break misconceptions about your community, like there's nothing more human than like holding hands and looking eye to eye and having a chat with woman to woman, even though we're from different walks of womanhood, I'm trans and you're not, or you're a black woman or you're a Muslim, we're, it's, you're holding hands and you're talking woman to woman eye to eye. And I just think that's something really powerful. And that's, that's why I wanted to use nails as like a medium for conversation and for activism. That's Charlie Craggs award-winning British transgender activist and author from London. She was number one on the 2016 New Radicals list compiled by Nesta and The Observer, number 40 in the Independent 2015 Rainbow list, and she's the founder of Nail Transphobia, a pop-up nail bar that brings awareness to the trans community. She's basically number one in my list. Why have you never been interviewed about this stuff before? I don't know. I think people just literally, I've been asked the same things in every single interview I've done. Just like, oh, like about my experience as a trans woman, but like why I started my campaign, like just the obvious stuff. And it's kind of, it's lovely. Like I, I, I'm not going to turn down an interview, but it's kind of redundant because you can just Google it and the same thing comes up a million times. So I think this is great. I think no, I've literally never been asked about anything and I have a lot to say. So I feel the same I um you know I still get asked the question like how did you start what and I'm like you could so easily do that <laughs> if you've got me in front of you use me for some unique yeah things. never mind um so why did you start trans sisters oh my god stop <laughs> if you dare if you dare. I mean like I said I'm not gonna turn it down so I'll answer well, we first met because I had my nail salon raw nails yeah you got in touch actually you got in touch <laughs> that's amazing it probably was me yeah it definitely bitch i don't i don't chase for interviews <laughs> even five years ago i wasn't chasing we don't do that in my house i'm sorry but do you know what it is i don't chase for interviews either obviously but what i spend a lot of time doing is browsing the internet and when something interesting and relevant or something that i can help with like crosses my path I'll always reach out like I you know what I mean I think it's important to create those connections so oh well actually it goes one step before that because I met you um I did a talk for Broadly when Broadly launched and you were there and like so I was like I told my friend who I was sitting next to me I was like oh my god I've just seen Shama Dean. I love her so much and then she brought you next to me and she was like I'm gonna get her and I was like no don't you dare and I was I literally I tr I like greeted you like the queen I think I was like oh my god it's it's an honour to meet you, like a little beggy, like 20, 20 year old. I was so embarrassed, but I was like, I need to let you know, like you are, you were like, I looked up to you so much, honest, honest to God, Sharma. So that's the first time we met, the first time we, which was that, and that was like six years ago now, five, six, six years ago. In like a big warehouse. Yeah, it was like the Broadly launch. And um, you, did you go to Central St. Martins or did I make I did. I did my foundation there and then I went LCF for my BA, Creative Direction. Well, that's cool. What did you do your dissertation in? I started um, my project from it. I started looking into like um, gender as a performance. And then I, for my final project, I created Nail Transphobia, which is like I said, my job now. So it's mad to be like that little coursework project that I did. I didn't even know how to paint a nail when I was doing it. It was just like an idea has become my job now and it's mad. And it's what did you do yours on? I did. <laughs> <laughs> no one's ever asked me that. Ever. You're welcome. <laughs> I mine on how um, Arena Home Plus magazine had the like fascist fashion appeal and how like mm. elements of Nazi propaganda and fascist propaganda often popped up in menswear. Like, wow, okay. So I was quite obsessed with how um, fascist regimes or any kind of far-right regimes 
use art, music, literature, fashion to like permeate their culture in mm. society. You know what I mean? Like Hugo Boss made the fascist uniforms. Like, you know, the thing about yeah. wing stuff is they're very, very organized and like it's very strategic. So I always think you should know your enemy. You should know exactly what techniques they're using. I do. think you win the better dissertation. I did the same dissertation that like literally everyone on my course did. We all just wrote the same thing and you're like right about Nazis and fashion. Yeah, I know. It was really fascinating to me, really, because I was just obsessed with ultimately what I was obsessed with then and I'm still obsessed with now is how do you communicate an idea? Like, yeah, yeah. How do you communicate an idea, but also how do you get people to do what you want? Literally. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's talk about now transphobia because that was the first um, way in which we met. Um, I founded One Nails in 2008, nine. And when did you start doing nail transphobia? 2013. Amazing. So you would have like seen Wah like in yes. Southern, and you would have like seen us do pop ups and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Like, what was it about nails that you thought were the best um, mode of expression for gender and identity? I mean, it was the way I started deviating norms with my gender expression because it pre transition, it was a way that I could find my femme and express my femininity without like pushing the boundaries too far like I could hide like I'm from around the corner from you I grew up in the state in Labrick Grove and I could hide I could put my hands in my pockets if I had to hide I had my nails painted but if I was wearing a dress you can't hide the fact that you're wearing a dress you know I would actually going to say mines I'd wear like crazy clothes but I'd wear like a big like jacket and then like when I get to say mines I'd like throw my jacket off like I'm here bitches <laughs> but when I get back to my state I was a smart I put that jacket back on on the way home I was like no not for me um, so you're holding someone's hand while you're doing someone's nails. And if you're trying to make allies and you're trying to break misconceptions about your community, like there's nothing more human than like holding hands and looking eye to eye and having a chat with woman to woman, even though we're from different walks of womanhood, I'm trans and you're not, or you're a black woman or you're a Muslim woman. It's, you're holding hands and you're talking woman to woman eye to eye. And I just think that's something really powerful. And that's, that's why I wanted to use nails as like a medium for conversation and for activism. Yeah, I always found that to be the most surprising thing for me with starting Wild Nails is I just thought I was going to start a nail salon for my homies, for the readers of the Wild magazine that I started when I was at Central St. Martins, actually. I thought I was just creating a youth club. But right from the get-go, it became a very, um, a very special place where people felt like they could be vulnerable. And we had mm. so many people like either share intense emotions or share stories that I kept thinking should I be a trained therapist to yeah. this? or you know I remember having a pregnant woman just burst into tears in front of me because she was just like I'm so hormonal I'm sorry <laughs> it was it was a really um it was a side effect that I didn't even um go into when I started it but it's exactly what you said that hand holding thing mm. because I come from Wolverhampton and I moved to London I very rarely um am physical with people so like not not people like yeah I hug people but you know with your family I would and I come from a big Jamaican family so I'd always be snuggling in the sofa like really intimately and physically close to my brothers and sisters and cousins and when I would go to the nail salon and the woman would be filing my nails, I literally would be holding her hand. I'd be holding her hand because I'd be desperate and crazy. The girl's engine. I'd like, you know, meditate and let my hand rest on hers. And I think like that human touch is something that in, this, in cities especially, yeah. you know, when people are lonelier than ever, like that's something that can't be underestimated for a nail salon. Yeah, I mean, it's the most primal thing, isn't it, as well? Definitely. The conversation, which you mentioned also, is incredibly important because, like, very rarely does any kind of entity have such a one-to-one -one conversation with someone for that long. Yeah. We just got them in with the nails, but I think the reason the salon was successful was because, like, it was just different. We, yeah. we, we Did we do a workshop? To, I can't remember what we did, but we met you. We did collabs. We did zine workshops. We had art exhibitions. We did so much stuff that was basically like helping girls understand that they could be independent. So, yeah. tell me about some of the conversations that you have had with now transphobia. What have been the most surprising? 
do you know what like most of them are the same but I think that shows how it's needed because I just I recognize that just people when I started in 2013 the cultural conversation around trans people was so basic like then we just it wasn't being talked about and that's why I started it and now it is being talked about it's almost being talked about a bit too much for my liking like it's like every second article and it's like <laughs> but can I ask you what like tell me if those conversations are typical tell me how that typical conversation would go you get someone sat in front of you who I'm assuming like what is the audience for now transphobia it's people who aren't trans so it's not like LGBT focused or trans focused it's aimed at people who would have never met a trans person so I travel around to like festivals or universities or museums or like brand events so it's like just like for the everyday person I've had eight-year-olds get their nails done I've had or even younger I've had three-year-olds I've had 83 year olds um it's not about the, like having nice nails it doesn't really matter it's about it's just so much more than that it's like the community and the message and the what what the nails are a catalyst for essentially um so for me it's a way of engaging people in the conversation around trans rights who wouldn't normally be engaged and the nails are a way of doing that because if I was sitting at these festivals or at these museums or whatever with a table full of brochures around transphobia no one would listen no one would care but if you're if you're offering a free manicure there's a queue out the door for people who will listen to you and tell me about that script let's start at the beginning with Lil Young Charlie <laughs> West London tell me about you and when was the first time that you became aware of your own appearance, your own body and your feelings within them? Probably, so I started expressing gender variance. I, like, I, I guess you could say I realised I was trans, but I didn't have the vocabulary for it, obviously, because a four-year-old, especially in the 90s, an Labrador girl doesn't know what the word trans means. My mum didn't even know what, like, do you mean? It just wasn't a thing. It wasn't part of our cultural conversation. Um, but I was expressing gender variance at about four, so I was saying, oh, I wish I was a girl, I'd go to bed and I'd pray every night, I'm Catholic, so I'd pray, oh, I hope I wake up a girl. And then um, I'd always like have all my friends were girls, I'd dress up as a girl, I'd like play with girl toys, and then it it kind of just didn't change into my teenage years. Like, it was, I'd still, all my friends were girls, I, st- I used to wear makeup going to all boys school, like, <laughs> I used to like, like I said, do my nails when I was going to all boys school, and I like, had to hide them because it was like a uniform and stuff. Um, and yeah, like it wasn't until I left that environment and went, which was a really toxic environment, like growing up in a council state, which is very macho, and then going to an all boys school, which is very macho, in a macho family. Like when I went to like art school, St. Martin's, it like blew my mind that I was like embraced for what I'd always been persecuted for. So I'd always like put down for my femininity, like or oh, since like seven, being called a faggot and a batty boy and stuff. Like to be then in a place where like, I was celebrated for it, I just, it, it made it, it made me grow and it made me accept myself and finally when I went to St. Martin's I like started understanding about like LGBT stuff trans stuff and I like I realized I wasn't gay because there's so many gay boys everywhere in St. Martin's and I was like that's not who I am like I love you but that's not me and then yeah then I started expressing when I went to St. Martin's like I said I dressed like super I would wear more makeup than I wear now as a trans woman like but like, I would like dress I'd use my um I finally could like express how I felt on the inside on the outside and that's when I started caring about fashion and makeup and hair and expressing myself in these ways. And then I started doing drag and then I realized drag wasn't me either. And then I started transitioning because I just, I realized there's a difference between like a drag queen performs and I wasn't performing. I was just being myself. Like I dread, I dread taking my makeup off at the end of every night and stuff. I'd like, I'd like be around my house. I'm not performing for anyone, I'm not getting paid and I'd be in full, full makeup a wig, dress, like, not even a dress, like, I just wear, like, top shop clothes, because I'm, like, I'm a girl, like, I'm not trying to be a drag queen, I don't want to wear a sequin dress, I just want to wear a little cute toothy, like, you know, so, yeah, that's kind of the story. Um, was there anyone that you looked up to when you were young, and you were, like, I want to look like them, or I want to be like them? The first person, so there was, when I was about, maybe, like, 11 or 10 I saw Nadia on Big Brother and she was the trans woman who won Big Brother and it was the first time so that's when I kind of understood that there's a a thing like I literally did not even realize trans people exist I didn't even know gay people existed like I said I'm Catholic I was raised that that's we just wasn't talked about and stuff so um yeah she I don't know if I looked up to her style wise no shade Nadia like we're friends now but like she wasn't my judge in terms of like aesthetics do you think Nadia was the way that a lot of the population first became aware of trans women? Oh, absolutely, yeah. 
because if you think about it, try and try and name a trans person after Nadia for 10 years, but also try and name one 10 years before. Like, there's just, it was just not talked about. There was like Caroline Cossie in the 80s, who was a bong girl and she was out for being trans. And she went, she did, did a lot of legal stuff in terms of um, going to like the European Courts of Law to like get our rights and stuff. But uh, prior to that, then there was April Ashley in the 60s. But they're really, apart from like Jerry Springer, where it's like, that's a man segment, which are so disgusting. There just was no representation it was all negative like you'd only hear about trans people when we've been murdered or when we were on jerry springer being like beaten up like that's the only time so yeah i like knew i was trans for since i was about like maybe like 11 but like i didn't want to until i went to st martin's i i didn't want to be trans because i didn't know that i'd be able to have a happy life as a trans person or even as a gay person like it just was like i was so badly bullied and like it just it wasn't okay in my in my immediate life like i didn't I didn't have any positive representations of it. I didn't have any, even, not even positive, but just, I didn't have any representations of it of where the person was just happy, like a normal person. So it was, yeah, it wasn't until I went to art school when I like found my people and was able to just like flourish and yeah. It's really funny because when you said like you tried a bit being drag, you tried, you know, you tried different things that is literally no different to any teenage beauty disasters. You're just fine. Yeah look for you like yeah. I shaved my eyebrows off that's the same thing. <laughs> I, I did all or in fact shaving my eyebrows off isn't probably an equivalent example I had like a phase of being like a real hood American rap girl looking person and then I had a phase of being like executive businesswoman type person and I was like what's the type of woman you yeah me because yeah. you know I was really tomboyish but had a curvy body or I was like mixed black Indian, but not looking one or the other. And I just was like, which brand of woman am I? Yeah. Like, what were some of the phases that you went through to like discover the woman that you wanted to look like or be? Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, my God. Um, so like, like I said, when I went St. Mines, I like had gone from being in an all boys Catholic school with a uniform where I couldn't express any of myself to go into somewhere where you can just be whoever you want so I went all out I was like wearing heels every day I was like wearing like I wore so much makeup if you saw how much makeup I would wear like but I never wear colored makeup like I don't wear any eyeshadow any lip color like I was wearing like full like make I was like how did I not get killed like honest to god like someone should have sat me down and been like Here, here's how you blend it or like if you're gonna do that at least blend it maybe but um, so at first it was all about just like living my like most like outrageous best life. Like, I was like so like just like very avant garde, like very like like draggy almost. And then I, I just I feel like my womanhood has just become more and more natural to the point where like because for me as a trans woman I have this a bit of a trigger about like I don't feel like I I don't like the feeling of performing my femininity. I like the feeling of just waking up in the morning and like I've got to a point now where I finish my laser. I'm like I've I've had all the surgery I want. I've fixed my hairline, so like, I don't need wigs anymore. Like, it's nice to be able to just wake up and be like, I'm a woman as I am. I don't need to wear a pound of drag makeup and a big costume and hip pads and a bra with like, and just like, and like, and wear sexy clothes to feel like a woman. I hate that feeling. So it's a bit of a trigger for me to be, I want to wear as little makeup as possible. And just like, yeah, like it's still done because I still makeup, but like, it's, it's like very refined. Like my womanhood is very refined now. And it'll probably get even more refined as I get older. I love that because that's applicable to all women. Yeah, yeah. All humans. It's yeah. Like, I want to wake up and feel comfortable in my own skin. I want to feel comfortable in my femininity. I don't want to feel like I have to play the role of whatever someone thinks that someone like me should look like or dress like. You know what I mean? I yeah. Think, no, I think you've been on an incredible journey and actually, like, sisters could learn something from you. How, how did you... What were the steps that you took to find your look when you said about like blending, learning how to blend the makeup? Like, who who helped you on this journey to get to your refined womanhood that you have now? Oh God, um, I think like you said, it kind of harks back to the kind of urgency of it. So for me, like, it wasn't. I didn't have the luxury of having time to figure out who I was. I would look in the mirror and I'd feel like a mess and I looked like a mess and I'd get so much shit all day to be quite frank like I was getting abuse all day every day 
getting laughed at, pointed at, like people coming in my face looking for fights, like just constant all day, every day because of how I looked, because of looking rough around the edges as a trans girl um, or even pre-transition just as a feminine boy. And so I just like would stay home and I just practice. And this is pre kind of like YouTube was a thing, but like, it, you know, like now it's like you can find a tutorial for everything and there's a million of them and they're really slick. But back then it wasn't like that, like, like early, I don't know, like, like I'm saying, like 2013, it just wasn't, it wasn't lit like the way it's lit today. So I was kind of just having to like, just learn, you just literally, I would stay up all night and I just like practice my makeup. I'd try on every outfit I have. I'd do like, I'd get Pinterest boards. If you make a mistake bad enough, like I've made some bad mistakes, you go home that day and you're like, this is urgent. I have to learn today. Like I'm not going to sleep until I learn. <laughs> so I've learned the hard way for sure. So let's talk about how you transitioned and the treatments that you got to make you look and feel like yeah. you. Um, let's start from the top. Let's talk about your hair. Yeah, so I've had my hairline done. So there's different ways. So like for me, like um, I had my hairline lowered. So they basically cut along your hairline and then they pull it down. So they're like my hairline was obviously too high. It was very masculine and they've pulled it down. I'm going to like fill in the edges a bit. Like my edges at the corners are still slightly high. So I'm going to fill those in with like a transplant because... Um, female hairlines are much more rounded men's hairlines are quite square so right now my hair like it's, it's good but it's not it's not where I want it to be um and then like so I'm wearing a, a piece at the back today but normally my, my natural hair is curly it's just too much like it's quite a lot of work to like deal with but I've only just embraced my curly hair it's kind of big yeah it's like quite tight curls so I've just been like obviously it's a very I'm sure you know like obviously you know like very different how you like treat curly hair to straight hair so I've like had to relearn Everything I've been doing for my straight, like to straighten my hair is just so damaging. So like the way I wash it, what I use to wash it, how I dry it, like everything. When you got your hairline done, how long does that recovery take? Uh, so I had quite, I had my nose done at the same time and I had my boobs done at the same time. So it was like a long recovery for everything. But I'd say for the hairline, I think they said after, it might have been after six weeks, you can start like dyeing your hair again and doing stuff. So I think six weeks was like, but I think after a month, mine looked good to go. Like, it's pretty, it heals pretty quick. It's mad. It's mad. It's so, it's like crazy. You wouldn't even know, like, if you got up close. When you said you got your um, hair, face and boobs done, is that with the London Trans Clinic? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm their ambassador. So, I've been going to them before I was ambassador. So, I, I went to them first when I was about... I can't remember, but basically in 2000, I think in 2017, I went and had my first round of like facial surgeries to like fix my, because um, it's called facial feminization. And basically like through puberty, like boys develop like bigger jaws and like receded hairlines and like bump like, a brow bone and stuff like that. So it's like a different kind of list of surgeries per girl. Like I didn't have a brow bone, but like I had to fix my chin and like my big chin and like my hairline and stuff. So um, I did that and then they made me their ambassador. If you're talking to your 16-year-old self, talk through what the process um, has been with the London Trans Clinic. So I discovered them because another trans girl who's quite big in the media called Paris Lees, who she writes for Vogue now, she, and she's a friend now, she, I saw she posted a YouTube video saying that she went there. So I was like looking for a place to go and I was going to go abroad. A lot of girls go abroad. Um, so I decided to go for a consultation. I like the doctor. It's just off Harley Street. Like, he's a really good doctor. Um, and yeah, like I wasn't, I, I've, I've never been scared about surgery because for me, surgery is not a choice. It's like a, it's, um, Necessary. yeah, it's not, a, it's not, I think you can only be scared about something if there's a choice to it. If you have to do something, you're not scared because you're like, I'd rather die. Like for me, I would have rather not to be deep and, but I'd rather die. Like I don't want to live if I have to be treated the way I was treated. My pre, my face being done, like my life was a living hell to be quite honest. Like I couldn't, I could not have hacked that for the rest of my life. And what was the first, um, surgery that you had how does it work and do, do you have to do it in stages you don't have to like if you've got Caitlyn Jenner money you can do it in Caitlyn Jenner time like she turned the party in like a night <laughs> but if you haven't got Caitlyn Jenner money like me I've had to space out so I've done about three rounds of surgery so I had like my first face surgeries which was like the the surgeries that I needed to get done like my chin was so big like I can keep wearing a wig because I didn't fix my hairline straight away but I couldn't hide my chin with makeup so like I got my chin and I got my cheek implants done because I had a really flat face um, and then I got um, my first, I got my hairline lowered as far as it would go the first time. And it was a two stage thing. And then like the next round of facial surgery, I had my hairline lowered even further. Um, I had my nose done and I had um, my boobs done. And I've had um, my uh, hips done as well. Cause I've always had bum and leg, but I've never, obviously I don't have a, 
a girl's shape. So I had just, it's like the slightest bit, like you wouldn't even think, I just look like a regular, regular girl. Like, I don't look like Kim Kardashian. I just look normal. But that's what, for me, like, I'm, it goes back to the aesthetic. Like, I've never wanted to look like a Barbie. I've always just wanted to look like a real girl every, around the way, elaborate growth girl. That's all I've ever wanted. What about your relationship with hair? So my natural, like, I was just so naturally hairy that, like, laser has been a journey for me. I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands on laser. But it's, it's, so, it's like, changed my life again because it's just, it's very triggering to be a girl. Like, it, um, there's cis girls who understand this as well, but to be a girl and to be, like, having to, like, shave your arms, like, and, because they're not even just, like, hairy, but they're, like, hairy. Like, they're, like, man hairy. Like, <laughs> like I had, like, I've got two brothers and I'm like hairier. They're both straight boys and they're like big gym boys. And I'm like hairier than both of them. Like for real. I'm like, God, why did you do this to me? What was the first bit you got lasered? Oh, bitch, there was no first bit. I got my whole body done straight away. <laughs> <laughs> there was no time to be hanging around. <laughs> my mum was like, let me help you. Let me get the light. So my mum helped because it's expensive. So my mum chipped in and we, it was just really urgent. It was three hours, those sessions, three hours of laser, like every, every month, I think it was. And wow. it, you learn to be good friends with that laser lady because you're spreading your bum cheeks for her and like with with glasses on at the same time looking like Ali G with and your wig is falling off while you're screaming while you're spreading your bum cheeks like it's a mess go and will you have to keep doing laser for the rest of your life so probably okay it's the sort of thing where you might have to top it up like every like I think they sell it every 10 years like you might like it's laser hair removal is a reduction thing. So it's not like the only thing that's permanent is electrolysis and electrolysis. You couldn't do like your whole body. It's like, it's, it, you got to do every follicle by itself and you've got to do follicles more than once. So like it would cost, prob- I don't know, maybe, like it would cost a lot, like hundreds of thousands, like a lot of money to do a, a lot of area. One of the reasons that I'm really unfamiliar with laser as a treatment is because historically laser was always said to be good for exactly your profile. Fair skin, um, dark hair. The, the first person I knew to have laser was a girl I went to St. Martin's with who was Italian. So same type of skin profile, like pale, paler skin, um, dark hair. And she always says, it worked really great on me. It wouldn't work on you. It wouldn't work on you. So I just kind of wrote it off. Do you know what I mean? In my head, I was like, well, I can't get laser, so I'm not even going to research or think about it. But then I see all these black bloggers in. Yeah. Go to Pulse Light Clinic. Everyone goes to Pulse. Pulse. Yeah, all my friends go there. So I think I'm going to, that's the thing that I'm going to do next for sure. Yeah. It's worth it. It hurts. It hurts. Like they say, because they say, oh, soprano doesn't hurt. It's like painless. I still scream. Like it's, for me, it's painful. And how, what is your relationship with? pain now as part of your transitioning because you said to me earlier that there's no choice for you so you just get on with it how yeah. how long have you been just getting on with it and basically shouldering the pain that you have to endure just to exist oh a good a hot minute but then it does okay so now i've got to be honest because at the end of the day women can have hair downstairs yeah so me getting downstairs done is um is cosmetic it's not corrective do you know what i'm saying so then when i'm doing my bum i'm like okay charlie this is a choice now like and i've got to the point where i'm like i'm every time i have it done i'm like i debate should you do it like are you doing this for yourself are you doing it for a man like who are you doing this for like it's a i mean i literally i can feel it in my soul when they do downstairs like the face your toes are for some reason your face your toes and your like downstairs area is just like I've never felt pain like it in my life it's been a lot of pain for like this kind of the rest of my life being a lot easier and the pain of like something like a laser is over in seconds but the pain of like trauma pain you know like that sort of pain that lasts forever like we all still carry the and harbor the trauma we and the pain of that trauma that we've experienced as children as teenagers and like that's for life but like a, a, a second of burning your skin with a laser it goes away after the second like it's really painful but it's it's not as painful as being like a woman in my opinion a woman with a beard is just not that's going to be a lot more pain of how how painful your life's going to be sorry a lot of facials and peel yeah about those yeah i've been working on my skin like i said because i've been kind of uh, trying to get to the point where I just don't have to wear as much makeup as as I I used to like, I used to have to like pound like literally like cake it on like not even like makeup like, I mean like literally like drag makeup to cover the beard area like it was like theatrical makeup so 
now I'm all about just like wearing as little makeup as possible. So if you can get your skin right, you could do it, don't have to wear as much uh, as much uh, foundation and stuff and you can yeah so for me like things like jet peels and tca peels have been really helpful so jet peel and where do you go to get it done so i go to london trans clinic for that as well and oh. yeah so they do so my late um the laser lady there candice has a she's got like a section called the skin and body clinic so you can go you don't have to go to london trans clinic it can be through london uh sorry the skin and body clinic and yeah, they do. So jet pills are like, it's a, some sort, I, I don't want to, I can't explain because it's, I'm not sciencey, but like it's some sort of like salt or something. And it's like salt and water and it like shoots out onto the skin. And do, why do you get facials? Just, just get- I've always struggled with my skin. So like even aside from the hair, like I've always had like bad acne and stuff. Like growing up, I had really, really bad skin. So like for me, fixing the skin is, like I said, a way of just like not having to wear makeup to cover the scars or to like, and even if you think about it, even if you cover the scar, like the redness, you've still got the texture of the scar, like the dent. So it's about like just trying to fix those as much as I can so that I can just feel like, because it kind of ties into my relationships as well. Like, so when I'm with a boy, it's nice to not have to feel like you have to wear a pound of makeup in bed, like for any girl, but especially for a trans girl, like dating a guy, like you don't want, you don't want to like, I don't know, it just makes you feel like, I don't want to scare him off and make him think like I'm a fucking drag queen or like a cross dress or something. You don't, you want him to like know that your womanhood is not painted on. It's like on, like, this is who I am. You don't have to, yeah, it's a kind of, a, it's an insecurity thing on my behalf, but it's just, it's the way it is. Maybe I'll get over that in the future, but I just like to feel confident in my, in myself. You get a lot of treatments done as maintenance or like, you know, necessity because they're in- absolutely integral to who you are as a woman what do you get when you just want to relax oh god you know i've never been asked that and i don't think i have an answer oh maybe my nails like obviously i can't have my nails done now but like i love getting my nails done like i can't do my own nails even though i do nails like i'm a trained manicurist but i just i like to i do i do enjoy getting my nails done definitely think it's important that you find time to get treatments that are for your pleasure not yeah your, you know, you're right I know you're right I've never had a massage like things like that I mean I've never at beauty stack we believe in increasing the power of beauty and wellness professionals around the world whether that's industry power economic power or simply the power to manage your career on your own terms we got you beauty stack helps you grow your business through our app you can build your portfolio be discovered by clients in our home feed and take bookings and payments all directly from your content because likes and shares don't put food on the table. Join the Beauty Stack community and download the app for free from the App Store today. Now, back to the show. Why have you not had a massage? Do you know what? I don't know. I don't know if it's a working class thing or just thinking it's like a luxury. Like, my mum would have never had a massage. So maybe that's why, like, you just don't even think. I think if, like, we kind of take on the practices of our parents a lot or the women around us, and, like, if they didn't, like... Even with me, like, I didn't go to, I've never been to a salon until, like, this year, like, and it's because, like, my mum, like, it's, like, maybe, again, like, a class, and or even my friends, like, we just do each other's hair in the kitchen, like, so, like, I've never, like, thought about going to a salon, and I was, like, oh, I've never been to a salon, and I got kind of upset for myself, I was, like, I deserve this, and then I went, and I was, like, actually, I prefer having it done in the kitchen, I don't like this man. <laughs> Equivalent would be, like, in Jamaican culture, you sit between your auntie's legs while they're braiding your hair. And I actually think there should be a black hair salon where it's just women on sofas and you have oh to... Oh, my God. Sit. Wouldn't that be cool? You need to do that. That's the next war. It, it immediately makes you feel like a child again and, like, protected and having that, like, intimacy. Oh, my God. I love that. You should do that. That's such a good idea. So we've been talking a lot on the podcast about how your identity has been tied up with your career and your earning potential. Yeah. Did feel like you had to be a certain type of trans woman to be accepted you've got to be a certain type it's almost like with like you know like with black women you've got to be a certain type of black woman to be a louder voice like you've got to be like a whitewashed almost black woman a lot of the time and you've got to like tone down your blackness and it's the same way with the transness you've got to be very like digestible for the white or for the not in the terms of trans person it would be for the cis audience you've got to be a very digestible trans person so you can't be like you can be trans but you've got to be like cis normative so you've got to be trans, you can be trans, but you've got to be like passable. You've got to be, 
if you're a trans woman, you've got to like sit like a woman, act like a woman, like not all women sit with their legs crossed, like, but like, and you'd be criticized much higher, like in a, a more like, there's more policing over your womanhood in the way that, yeah, like you, you'd be criticized for something that like a woman can do, but like if you're a trans woman doing it in the media, like you're not, it's not okay, like. How have you dealt with that when it comes to your first very public um, project, which is your book? Yeah. Um, you know, the book is really exciting. It's well done. Thank you so much. Um, you know, with this legacy thing that you have created, how did you decide how you wanted to present yourself, um, both in terms of on paper, but also physically with your book? Oh, interesting. I feel like I've changed so much since then, but it was very like, it was being digestible. It was right at the start of my career. I got off of the book quite early on in my career. I definitely have fed into these kind of, um, these kind of expectations of trans people in the media to be a certain type of trans person. Now I'm like, I would like, I, when I go and do talk, I do, my, most of my money is made from public speaking and I'll turn up in a tracksuit. I'm like, I'm not going to wear anything different to what I'd wear normally. Like, why should I dress different for you? You've booked Charlie Craggs to speak, so you're going to get Charlie Craggs. Whereas when I did my book, I thought I had to wear like a dress and heels and like to everything. And I'm like, no, I don't like wearing heels. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't enjoy that. That's not my, that's not what I want to do. So I've changed so much since then. I was like, I think I was, I was like 21, 22 maybe when I did my book. So I was like a literal, a baby. So it was, yeah, I do, I'm, I'm, I don't hold it against myself, but I've just grown so much as a woman since then. Just to know that my worth is not in how I'm, I look or how I'm, even though there is power in that, there's power in more than one way. I rate you so hard for that. That one. Can I have that in writing, please, for my CV? Can I have it in writing that you rate me <laughs> on the back of my next book? Yes. How did you get that mindset of just not caring? Oh my god! When you've been treated badly. And like, I've been treated badly for a long time. Like, even pre-transition, if you look at like being a seven-year-old and being called a batty boy and stuff, like you just get to the point where you're like, I just don't care. I don't owe any of you shit. Like if you just, it's almost like you got to go through the anger and the upset, and then you come out on the other side of just like a crystallized bad bitch. And you're just like, I just like. But there was a long time where I was just like angry, and then from the anger comes um, just a sense of like, I'm just like, you're so powerful in yourself. Because I still get. Um you know, I still can get really sensitive to like criticism and feedback, or I would say that I'm still um, aware of moving through the world in a way where people have a positive reaction to me, you know what I mean? Like, these things def I, I definitely am not secure enough in myself to truly go out with in a tracksuit and not like no man. What? Are you serious? Yeah, like to me, do you know what I always joke about, right? Like I'll wear, a, I'll go, like I can't wait. I always joke that I can't wait till I'm a billionaire in a tracksuit. Like I'll look hood as fuck when I'm a billionaire. When I'm like, when I feel like I've got, but for me, it's like I need to have these things. Like I need, I feel like I need to have like, financial security and power security and all of those things to be like free and to be me and I feel like you're so ahead of the curve on that because for you to not have um not feel like you need these props like I still feel like I need props you know what I mean like I'm not brave enough to shave my head or I'm not brave enough to not look pretty or girly you know what I mean I yeah I'll, I'll go out wearing no makeup but that's because I spend like loads of money on facials and I've got lash extensions and my eyebrows tattoos it's not like truly au naturel you know what I'm saying I'm gonna wrap up by asking you your beauty stack so from it's a quick fire round so Let's just you, like you know where you get it done um I'm gonna ask you the treatment and you're just gonna say where you get it done okay okay all right, so let's start from the top of the stack. Who does your hair? Um, so I've recently begun to unruly curls in Latimer Roads. Local, it's great. Yeah, love them. You get facials done. Where? Who does them? Um, so my girl Candice at Skin and Body Clinic, which is part of London Trans Clinic, does it. I think it's actually technically part of London Bridge Plastic Surgery. So London Bridge Plastic Surgery is like the umbrella, and then there's like London Trans Clinic, Skin and Body Clinic. But she does all my facials and jet peels and. I've had a lot of chemical pills recently with her, yeah. Lovely. A brows you like? Um, I've always done my own brows. Like, I've just never, I've never had my brows done by anyone else. I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying about just, like, 
my mum's never got her brows done. My friends have never got their brows done. So I've just never got my brows done. Um, what about lashes? Do you have lash lifts, lash, lash extensions? No, I've always been lucky because I'm because I'm hairy everywhere else. I've got good hair on my eyelashes. So I've always had. I've got really long eyelashes, so I've never really had to do. Do you um, ever get your makeup done professionally? Um, I do for shoots and stuff, but I hate it. I'm not gonna lie. I like. I think you'd know your face best. And whenever I've had my makeup done, I'm always like, oh, you've not got my lip right, or you've not got. You just you know what looks good on yourself, and I've never looked as good as when I've done my own makeup. And I've had, like, top makeup artists do my makeup. I've just never liked it. What about body treatments? Do you get body scrubs, massages? And every now and then I'll get, like, MLD, which is where you just basically clean out your um, lymph nodes, which helps you to, like, heal better, especially when you've been having lots of surgery. But even if you're just ill, it means you're, like, on top form. It's, like, amazing. The body is an incredible instrument. And my girl, um, Lindsay, and she's in Cambridge at the moment. She does that. And she comes down to London and does it for me. I actually want to take Lindsay's number because I've got so many friends who want lymphatic drainage. Mass. It's really good. Helps you sleep better as well. Yeah. Um, definitely. Do you mark your body? Tattoos? Piercing? No. Penis are awesome, aren't you? What's your nail vibe and who does them? So I just go local. Um, although I want to start going. So oh, there's a trans girl who does nails. Um, her nail place is called the House of Philandies. Um, is she really? Yeah, I want to connect you guys. Oh, oh my god! When you were talking earlier, I was like, "Do they know each other?" Because we I, follow each other, yeah. Yeah. So my friend Kabira, who's a trans woman that I really I follow like, her as well, yeah. Yeah. I, do you know we've known each other since we're seventeen? We met on like a fashion chat room. Like what? <laughs> oh my god! So random. So she introduced me to House of Diphalanges, and I was like, "This is incredible." Yeah. So, on beauty staff. If I'm gonna hook you up, I'm gonna sort that out. I'm gonna start going to her from now on because I think it's really important to support support your own. Is hair removal something you couldn't live without? Yes. <laughs> like there's no way. Like honestly, all I'm saying. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm. Yeah. I don't even know. I don't even have any words for that. Yeah. Basically, I just. I would not. Um. Yeah. I just. I couldn't. I couldn't not have it. I just couldn't. What about wellness? Do you ever get holistic treatments? I haven't. I'm very spiritual, though. Like, I'm really into all that, but, like, I've never tried it. Okay, I'm hooking you up. Um, do you have a life coach or a therapist? I don't, I don't need a life coach. I don't care. Like I said in my interview, I don't care. <laughs> <That's the laughs> and are there any other treatments that you'd ever want or that you've been looking at? You're like, ooh. I really want to get my eyebrows microbladed. Me to join the fam. I'll get laser, you get microblade. It's a deal. I'm down. Thank you so much, Charlie. I'm so happy Thank you. to hear from you. And yeah, I can't wait to hang out with you again when this is all over. Me too, Shama. Thank you so much for having me, babes. Podcast. Thank you. If you're looking for a place to book unique treatments or if you're a beauty professional and want to list your business with us, don't forget to download the Beauty Stack app for free from the App Store. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and leave us a review. Till next time.